Uh, Shimomura uh, is a terrific biochemist, and he set himself a very fundamental problem. It's a problem that several other people have tried to do in many cases, and that is, how is it that these jellyfish can produce light? They're bioluminescent. They generate light. Now, there's fungi and fireflies and glowworms and all sorts of organisms that produce light, and for the most part, they do it differently from one another. So that was his project. How do you produce light? And what I'm going to say is really an example of where accident occurs here. So he sets his mind to doing this. He collects lots of jellyfish. He actually pays his kids to find the jellyfish in certain <laughs> cases. And then he grinds things up, and he's trying to isolate the protein that produces light. And he fails. And he fails repeatedly. It doesn't work. No matter what he tries, he cannot get it to work. One night, he's worked all through the day. The prep has still failed. He decides, it's dark, I'm going to go home. He takes his prep and he throws it in the sink. Eh, there's seawater in the sink, jellyfish parts and so on. And he turns off the light and he's about to leave and he looks back at the sink and it's glowing brightly. This is the scientific method at work. <laughs> right, throw it in, in the in sink. In the movies, so, yeah. so Throw it in the sink, throw it on the floor, whatever. It, it usually sometimes, well, not very rarely works, but every once in a while. And he realizes there must have been something in the sink that allowed this light to be produced. It must have been in the seawater, and he eventually realizes, rather quickly realizes, it's calcium. And that if he adds calcium to his prep, he's going to produce light. And so he uses that, and he purifies the protein. And so you'd think that would be the end of the story. Uh, he found the molecule that produces light. Unfortunately, it's the wrong color. The jellyfish produce a green light, and he's got something that produces a blue light. <laughs> he looks at it, thinks about it for a while, and says, there's got to be something else, something that converts the blue light or the energy that would go into blue light and produces green. So he takes a handheld ultraviolet lamp, and he goes back and looks at all of his samples again and finds one where the activation of the ultraviolet light, or blue light, also t makes it glow and fluoresce green. He says, that's the, the other component. And he called it the green protein. We call it green fluorescent protein. Fluorescence is where an object or molecule absorbs light of one color and gives off light of another color. So both parts of this, finding the original protein that produced light and finding the green fluorescent protein were, in a sense, accidents, not expected results. I should also say that that first protein, the one that uh, only works if you add calcium, was then eventually taken up by other people and shown, if I put this in a cell, I can watch the cell as it changes in various conditions. And when the calcium comes up, because this is in the cell, it'll show me that the calcium is going up in the cell. So it's one of the very first markers of being able to see what, how changes in calcium occurred. Our work with GFP said, hey, we can, we can use this as a lantern to tag anything we want and then watch it. HIV, the AIDS virus. We have a common view of viruses that they infect cells, the cells explode, and the viruses are then spread to other cells. Well, if that's the case, then they're out in the open or they're out in the bloodstream, and presumably one could maybe make an antibody, a, have a vaccine against these, if that's how it works. But scientists have found that by labeling HIV with green fluorescent protein, so wherever it is, you see it because the virus is labeled with this marker, and then studying cells in mice, they found a rather remarkable thing, is that the infe uh, an infected cell went up to a non-infected cell and basically kissed it. And the virus went from inside one cell to inside the next cell. That's a whole different way of looking at the problem. Now you have to really start to think about how are you going to control that? How do you control maybe look at things that might interfere with the 
association of the infected and non-infected cell together. It changes the way we look at this. The thing that was wonderful about GFP is that GFP allowed people to look in real time at, in, a, in a dynamic way at life as it was occurring. One could follow things and not have to take snapshots and try to imagine how things were put together. You could watch living tissues and see how metastasis took place or how cells developed by watching what was going on. And did you know exactly what you were doing? I mean, that was no, the no, intent? No, no, yes. <laughs> I hardly I ever know exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> but, uh, I, when I, I heard about this in the seminar, uh, and I realized, uh, mainly because I, I spend most of my time uh, working with a small, meaning 1 25th of an inch, a millimeter long, transparent worm and that I could see every cell in the animal if I labeled them with the green uh, fluorescent protein. And I realized I could label cells, watch proteins in the cells. Uh, I never imagined all the different applications that people made. Merton Shalfi, thank you so much.